And I'm like, I had no chance of finishing Galatians five and six last week. Uh, Galatians six by itself was going to be a full week. And we did like four verses in Galatians five last week anyway. So I want to welcome everyone. Welcome Dara uh, uh, for joining us. And uh, we are in Galatians chapter six. We are going to be next week. We're going to go back to the book of Acts. So we'll be, we'll be in Acts 15. So if you're watching this on the playlist on YouTube, under the, under the Galatians playlist, there will not be another video out of that playlist. It'll be back in the Acts playlist. So we'll go back to that playlist there in the book of Acts. So I want to encourage you to, to do that if you're watching us there. Make sure, of course, that you subscribe to the YouTube channel and that you like uh, uh, the videos that we do and everything else as well. So let me open with a word of prayer, if that's okay. And we'll, I, I guess even if it's not okay, I'm going to do it anyways. You're all muted and I have the power to mute you if I want. Uh, so I'm going to do it anyway. So uh, Father, we, we thank you for this day and, this, and your mercy. We pray indeed for your um, Holy Spirit to be with us, to comfort us and encourage us and, and give us discernment and wisdom as we wrestle with the scriptures. It's so easy, Lord, to be overwhelmed by so many things happening in the world. Our brother Bob, especially in his health, we are so, we plead with you for his uh, health and recovery, give him rest and strength, take away the infection that he can be restored uh, to our study with, uh, with Jackie. And we just pray for your mercy upon him. Uh, and especially we pray, Father, for the people that are starving to death in Gaza um, and um, lack of water, lack of food. Uh, people swam out to get uh, parachuted food in the, in the Mediterranean Sea and they drowned. Um, people were crushed by a pallet of, that was air, air dropped in a couple weeks ago. This should not be, Lord. This should not be. Hospitals being bombed. Um, Lord, help this to stop for the sake of Israel, for the sake of Palestine, for the sake of Muslims, Christians, and Jews, for the sake of the United States, and for the sake of the world. May this not escalate any farther, but help us now as we stop to get our minds back onto the book of Galatians and what this means and what the text means and what it means for us individually as well as us collectively and us as the larger body of Christ. We thank you now for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Uh, if you haven't, those of you guys here in the Zoom call, but even those of you guys who are watching on Facebook or whatever else, I, I actually really would encourage you to watch the series that I'm, I just put together, the live streams on introduction to Israel, uh, Palestine. The idea was I wanted to make them separate from the conflict in Gaza right now, but provide a context for why Hamas and the Palestinians are doing what they're doing and why Israel does what it does when it responds. And so I hope that I'm, I'm accomplishing that. It was supposed to be five episodes, but I didn't come anywhere near finishing episode four. So episode four B will be next week and episode five will get pushed off an extra week. So I encourage you to, and then share them with others to say, hey, here's a good way. They're each 30 to 45 minutes long. I think the first was 30. The last two have been 45, last three have been 45. Uh, and so here's a good way to kind of get and find out what's going on. You're going to hear both narratives for the most part, even though there's more, more than two narratives, uh, but I want to encourage you to do that. So, okay, here we go. Uh, Galatians 6, any questions or thoughts we have as we get into Galatians 6? Okay, so Paul's argument is God has accomplished his promises through Jesus. He's the seed of Abraham. He's made the two into one new family through, through the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. The law has then been fulfilled in, that, in, in one sense then, and no longer does it the means by which we distinguish who the people of God are. Now it's through faith in Christ Jesus and salvation by, by grace. That is our identity. Those of you who still want the Gentiles to be circumcised are trying to make them lesser, second-class people, and imposing the law. And so Paul is going to have very strong words here at the end of Galatians 6 that remind us of the words, the strong words in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 1 also. So let's begin, if somebody has their Bible handy and would like to read Galatians chapter 6, and let's read the first 10 verses. And it's going to sound like he's going to contradict himself here. We'll see if anybody catches it. Um, but let's, uh, let's, anybody want to read Galatians 6, 1 through 10? I have it. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm out of the NRSV. Um, bear one another's burdens. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. 
If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Excellent. Thank you, sir. All right, welcome, Derry. We just started Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Uh, any thoughts, any comments, any observations here? The section on pride was a little tricky because... Okay, yes. Yeah, I, I, I got lost in that as I was reading it. Okay, early on in the beginning of the chapter? Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, what does he say when you're, uh, when you're um, helping the other one? You're restoring somebody in gentleness. Yeah. It almost sounds like you could become prideful. Is that what he's saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because you're, because they're in error and you're restoring them. So you need to, you need to have, I notice it's the fruit of the spirit, have the, the, the fruit of gentleness. That's the kind of person that needs to be the one restoring them because otherwise they'll be more likely to be tempted. That's, that's kind of the idea. So with that note, let me point out, Paul has not left the topic of the fruits of the spirit and the deeds of the flesh. He's not left the topic of fulfilling the law of Christ, which is the law of love. Chapter breaks make us think, okay, we're on to something new. It's not something new. It's the application of the life of the sinful nature or the fruits of the spirit. So this is the application part. And the other thing that we can do with this is we can take this as like pithy little proverbial statements, like one statement is isolated from another statement, but they're not. They're all on related themes that actually circulate throughout the entire book. So we have to keep that in mind there uh, and that'll impact us. All right, anybody else? Any other thoughts that you might have here as we, as we begin? Uh, I'm just trying to find the contradiction Oh, you haven't found that it. You mentioned. Are the inconsistent? It's inconsistent. Yeah. Okay. Anybody see it? It's at the beginning, early on. I'll give you a hint. First five verses. It's in the first five verses. He says two things. Bear one another's burdens and bear your own burdens. Exactly. Yeah. Each one's responsible for his own work. Verse four. But verse two, bear one another's burdens. Wait a minute. Well, which one is it? Am I responsible for my own work? Or do I bear my brother's burden? So again, we have to let's, let's uh, reckon through that. Very good. Somebody have any, anybody have any thoughts on that or anybody, anything else? I just figure it's, you know, bear your own burdens, but when it's too much for you, somebody else is there to help you out. Or when it's too much for that somebody else, you need to be there. You to help, help them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You can probably say the same thing both, both, both ways. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yep. And and maybe the idea of it is, well, bear one of those burdens, but I don't want you to think that you could become, that you don't have an obligation for your own self also. Right? If you're the one that somebody else is helping, it's like, yeah, okay. So it's very, very good. Very perceptive. Somebody else? Yep. That was good. That helped. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so uh, again, jump in if you have any thoughts or comments here. Paul is giving these concrete illustrations of what it means to live as individuals in a community guided by the Spirit. How's that? Okay. And at the same time, we have two things working together, personal responsibility and mutual accountability. So bear one of those burdens, share with your teachers, what you sow, you'll reap, and you'll, uh, th that's the whole idea. And what Paul's concerned about, uh, let's go back to chapter 5 uh, for a second, and uh, let's see. Um, the deeds of the flesh in verse 19, starting in verse 19. The deeds of the flesh are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, things like these. And I warned you, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice how factions and, and divisions and arguments and, and conflict was a part of the deeds of the flesh. And so Paul's concerned that the way we do conflict resolution, the way we deal with one another, the way we deal with differences is going to produce ill behavior that causes conflict and divisions within the body. And Paul's answer is, nope, not going to work. Uh, so instead, Paul's answer is, look, we need to stop and realize 
we're all going to be judged before God. Isn't that an interesting statement, right? We're all going to be judged before God. Uh, so uh, let's see if we can go through it now. Here we go. Verse, uh, the very first, first verse. Okay. A brother is caught in a sin. Restore him gently. I think we addressed this one, but it falls concerned with how we restore a brother or sister in sin, how we do it without shaming them, without thinking ourselves better and superior. It needs to be done with the spirit of gentleness, which is one of the fruits of the spirit. And so uh, then the second part, and we need to bear one of those burdens. And tell me what this means. And fulfill the law of Christ. What do you think he means by the law of Christ? Love one another? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The yeah. law of Jesus is love the Lord your God, God love and love your neighbor as yourself. Neighbor. But notice oftentimes, and let's go back to chapter five for a second, because this is from, I think, uh, last or two weeks ago, I think it was, right? Uh, verse 14. The whole law, chapter 5, verse 14 of the book of Galatians, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice he went to commandment number two. He omitted number one. Well, how could that be the whole law? When the first law, because the embodiment of loving your neighbor as yourself is an expression of how we love the Lord our God. So number two assumes number one. Uh, and that you can't, you actually can't separate the two commandments out anyways, as much, as much as we might want to do. Isn't so I think, reflect, isn't that reflective as well in their image? I mean, they're yeah, image So exactly. Yeah. That, that's right. So, and, and, and maybe it's worth repeating here now, Anthony, what you brought up that this is what it means to be human is to bear God's image and the primary and, and bearing God's image. If we did in Genesis a couple of years ago now was a role. It's a, it's a responsibility. It's a task. Go make me known. Go let them know what I'm like. Go reflect me as an idol or an image of an like emperor might, be, might do in a foreign part of the empire. That's what the king looks like. That's who, you, that's who the emperor looks like. That's who you're paying taxes to. So God makes humanity to say, go make me known. And the way we do that is we love the Lord our God and love our neighbor as ourselves. I think it's John 6. I'm sorry. It's, it's a Luke 6, 38, uh, that when we love our, and I'm going to paraphrase it, when we love our enemies, we do what God does, because God's kind to ungrateful people. Ah, that's what we do. We, when, we, when we love our enemies, we're actually loving like God does. And I think that's exactly the point. So um, very good. Okay. Um, bear one of those burdens, of course, helping one another, supporting one another, everyone takes, but at the same time, we take responsibility for ourselves. Okay. Verse three which I don't know any translation that does this. Uh, my translation begins with, and I, uh, I'm sorry, I'm verse five, uh, chapter five. Oh, it does. Okay. My translation begins with the word for, uh, which it should, if your translation does it, it should. For, okay. So the word for, and, and again, you have to be careful in English because the word for can just be like a preposition. Uh, this, this book is for that person. That, that's a preposition. But the word for could be a, a con, what we call a conjunction, and, or, nor, but, for, right? Conjunction, junction. All right, here you go. Um, for those of you guys in America, that brings uh, happy happy memories. I got a lot of smiles. Got more smiles on that than like anything else I do. Uh, there you go. All right. But uh, a, a conjunction is connecting something to something earlier, right? This and this. And that's a conjunction within a sentence. The word for often means the reason why. So it goes back to verse two, in other words. When you bear one of those burdens, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. And the reason why is because if you think you're something when you're nothing, you deceive yourself. Now it's, if you think you're something and you don't bear your brother's burdens, then you're deceiving yourself. Instead, we're actually all nothing equally, and we need to bear one of those burdens. I think that's kind of the idea of, of verse three, the word four, I think is an extremely important word uh, in the, in, especially in letters and the epistles of the, of the new Testament. So, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, self-deception is a danger um, always that warns against spiritual pride. Here we go. Um, uh, each one must examine his own work. And then verse five, each one will bear his own load. So that's kind of the, the counter to, Hey, don't think that you, you can get out of this just because we have to bear one of those burdens. You don't have to do anything. No, we all have this personal responsibility as well. Okay, verses six through 10. Any thoughts or questions on that? 
All right, remind me, I got a quote from N.T. Wright that I want to share with you, but I want to discuss a few things before we do that. Uh, verse six, share all good things with the one who teaches. Okay, that's, and my Bible has a, I think a paragraph marker at verse six. Um, and actually, let me just look at um, Galatians six. Uh, yeah, I guess I can see why it, it does. It, it, it's, it's rightly so. The Greek text is not emphatically clear that it is, but it, I think it functions that way. So, but it hasn't transitioned completely from the topic. Okay, the topic is still how we bear the fruits of the spirit in terms of the, this larger body. And, and there's going to be a number of issues happening here that I want to, cultural, contextual things that we have to flush out to make sense of this passage. So let me see if I can do that. Uh, first question. off, yeah, go ahead, please. With, with these commandments and saying love your neighbor, are is he talking about all neighbors, believers, and non-believers? So when ah. I go to help them or whatever, am I behaving the same way with somebody who believes and somebody who doesn't? I anybody have a comment on that? I got I got a I got a bug in my water, and I I'm not going to go get more water, so I'm just going to get the yeah. bug out. Well, sorry to tell you that's oh, maybe told too much information. Go ahead, if John. I remember accurately from your past teaching, okay. I we talked about who is your neighbor many times. Mm -hmm. I seem to believe that you have considered non-believers either not neighbors or not the same kind of a neighbor. Okay. And that you that didn't could necessarily in some context, uh, in contents and in context, I thought there were times where we read scripture where you had said he's speaking to believers and they were using yeah, the yeah. term neighbor. Uh, but well, I, I but I, I also think the seem word to neighbor think, was used there. But go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go uh, ahead. But I also seem to think, in other contexts, right. neighbor has applied to both. Yep. Well, weren't in that instance, if my memory does serve me, which often it doesn't, <laughs> um, you were talking about. Uh, it was kind of like Matthew 25. Ma Matthew 25. These okay, little there you brothers go. Yep. of mine as the least of these. Yeah. Okay. I would think if we're showing God to the world, which includes Gentiles, yep. it would mean anybody as in the Good Samaritan. Exactly. Okay. There you go. Very good, Derry. Yep. That would be my, my yeah, take yeah. on it. I think that's you're right on what I would. Yeah, that's where I tended to lean. Okay, very and good. That's why it took. I took note when it did not seem to apply. Okay, so um, we have two different things happening here that 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 you got John in your mind there, and I understand why you have it. So the first is well, the biblical command is love your enemies. So it's clearly everybody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The the who is your neighbor is defined in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And your neighbor is the Samaritan, which is obviously not an Israelite. So it's everybody. So the command to, to love your neighbor is to everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, it's possible, though, go back to, I think it's Karen that asked the question initially, right? Okay. It's possible that you could argue from the context of a passage like this that he's talking about neighbors within the, within the people of God. Because he's writing to the church in Galatia and telling them how to treat one another. That doesn't mean that they only love their neighbors mm -hmm. within the church. It just means that in this context, he's only talking about those neighbors. It doesn't mean he's not. But so the biblical right. command is to love everyone, because when we love even our enemies, we reflect who God is and God loves everybody for God to love the world. Okay, So that's that's the first thing that's out there. So it is possible that a context might actually say, well, here he's only talking about the church, but that doesn't mean that we don't love others either. It's just simply he's saying, Hey, you guys are not loving one another, and you're supposed to love your neighbors. See, makes sense to how me. How do you okay. show love? How do your neighbors know you love them? Yeah, and uh, the go harder ahead, person to love as well for me would be not necessarily those that are close to me, either in my beliefs or religion or uh, Christ. So I would think it would apply to 
all yeah, people. Yeah, sure. Right? I mean, sure, that's, sure. The, the, the easier person to love is those that you might be more compatible with than right. your outside uh, neighbors. Although I think we're all going to confess, sometimes the hardest person to love is your spouse, right? I mean, it, it, <laughs> the, the ones that are closest to us become the hardest. Yeah. It, that's just, that's true sometimes. Uh, all right. So Karen, your question was, uh, how do they... How yeah, how do they know that I love them? How does my how do how does my neighbor know I love them? If I'm there's supposed little, to love them, yeah, go ahead. It seems like there's well, something I'm supposed to do, just not, or maybe but, it's yeah. By the way, you right. treat them, but right. uh, that yeah. but that's you know that what's the definition of the definition of good treatment? Right. But were you going to add something, Sandy? I I was going to say it, it's your behavior with those people and the yeah. way you treat them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it can be like the tone of your voice. Exactly. But in the Bible, it says, like, did you visit me in prison? Did you okay. feed me when I was hungry? Did but you? But that's another, that, that's that's well, the other topic that we hadn't gotten to yet, Derry, right? Yeah. Because that's yeah. Matthew 25. So you're bringing in, yeah, yeah okay. All right. So I'm, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think we're going to get confused if we if we go down that path yet. So if you don't mind me cutting okay. you off there. Um, sure. Yeah. So... Um, I, I think you can still apply the general principle of, dairy, uh, of that idea, and that is the love that we're called to have is sacrificial love that where I lay down my life for mm -hmm. the other, I think I consider the other more important than myself. So listening right. to them when they talk, right? Treating them the way you treat them, the way someone cuts you off in the grocery store and you don't get angry with them. If they cut you off in a car, we're not going down that path. We discussed that last week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I had a moment today. It was not going. It, 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 I, I didn't do anything wrong. I just was really struggling um, with patience. And it was. You, you had another moment today. I, yeah, I had another moment today. And it was, I, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything to anybody. I just had a really tough time being patient because I just wanted to get home um, and, and get back and get to work. And get, right. But, anyways. But the, uh, listening to people, not cutting them off when they talk, right? L valuing what they have to say, uh, caring for them. Hey, I, I heard that you were sick. I'll pray for you. Whatever it might be. If it's, uh, I, I think it could be the whole, the whole gamut of things. Just people know, they'll know you're Christians by, by our, love, our love for one another. Okay, so I, does I that think, help? Go ahead. I personally, I personally think one of the big things is when you're speaking with someone, are you really listening to them? If you're yeah, actually yeah. open to listening. Right. Right. What'd you say? <laughs> I got you back. <laughs> okay. You finally got it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's right. So exactly. And that's hard to do, right? Especially when you're in an argument because you, you, you want to, you want to get your response out. So you're, and you're ready for your response. As soon as they stop breathing, I'm going to, I'm going to speak. Uh, and I'm not actually listening to the rest of what they have to say. So uh, yeah, all those things, caring for them, bringing them food, you know, bringing them, uh, caring for their needs, you know, uh, not getting angry because their trash can was in your way, it, you know, um, being, yeah, being kind, I think all, all those things. So all right, the first thing then was, back to the question here, but as we, we'll go back to the text, who is it that we're called to love? And our neighbor's everyone, because obviously the good Samaritan tells us who our neighbor is, and it's the Samaritan. That, that's everyone. We're called to love everyone. Even God loves his enemies. So when we, act, when we love our, our enemies, we act like, act like God. However, Judgment Day is based upon what we did to God. How, did we love God? Right? Two commandments. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbors yourself. And I'm actually not separating the two commandments here. I'm just simply going, let's start with the first commandment. Judgment Day is, did you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord? Did you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? The way that manifests is actually in how you treat his people. That's not the only way it, it manifests itself. So don't misunderstand me. But that's what the parable of the, of the sheep and the goats that Jerry was alluding to in Matthew 25 is about. Jesus specifically says, so those of you guys in America, you know, back in the day at 2 a.m. on television would be these starving children in Ethiopia or, you know, all good things. But they would always say, give us money because Jesus said, I saw you hungry and I fed you. I saw you, or prison ministries. I saw you in prison and I visited you. That, okay, I'm not, we should give to those ministries and support and feed the kids. 
not always what the text, uh, uh, the proper appropriation of that text. What Matthew 25 is getting at is, when do we see you hungry? When do we see you in prison? When do we feed you? When do we clothe you? Jesus' answer is the way you treat my people. Whatever you did to the least of these brothers of mine, I have a chapter in my book, These Brothers of Mine, on this particular point. These brothers of mine is used in the Gospel of Matthew. The least of these and these brothers both always reference the followers of Jesus. And so it exclusively means then the parable of the sheep and the goats is the way you treat my people is the way you treat me. And that's what the unbelievers ultimately will be judged for. And I think even to some extent, the believers will, will be judged for. That's another, another topic and for, for another day. But I think that becomes that, that fundamental thing. So that's the distinction, John, that maybe is causing you some confusion. Don't please don't confuse them because I think I do advocate that we love everybody, including our enemies <sighs> and our neighbor is everyone. But what we are judged for is based on how we treated God's people. And you can argue from Revelation 21 and other judgment texts that it expands beyond Matthew 25, but that's what Matthew 25 is getting at. So, all right. Thank Does you. that make sense? Any questions? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's very good. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, and good questions, uh, Karen, um, also. So, um, that's okay, really here we go. Good, that's a really good layout, but and I, and I understand what you're saying. It's everything. Yeah, 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 please. But by default, there again, I'm going back to the image bearers. So it's it's... It literally is everyone, is it not? Yeah, I mean, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It is everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's right. Uh, and that's why uh, to go back to the Israel Palestine thing, for example, right? You know, you speaking out against Israel is like I'm. Well, if my son was doing something unjust, this is in my blog today that, that came out today. If my son's doing something unjust. I need to tell him because he's going to get in trouble. He's going to suffer the consequences for that. To love Israel means to speak up because what they're doing in Gaza is not good for them. And it's not they're going to help them with their national security. So I think we need to, we need to understand that, that, that perspective there. It's loving, you know, for a, a woman that's being abused. Unfortunately, this is tragic because so many churches say your job as a woman is to suffer well as a Christian, even though your husband's abusing you. That is not loving your, your husband or your partner or your spouse. That is not loving someone who's committing a crime. They need to suffer the consequences so that they don't commit that crime against anyone else, including you. And it's also not loving your children if there happen to be any children in the room. Uh, they need help, and you seeking their, their help is the best thing that you can do. So, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts there? Welcome, Marcus. Welcome, Dara. I think I already said welcome to you, Dara, but that's okay. Uh, welcome, Marcus. Um, okay, here we go. So uh, now, verse six then. Paul's saying there are full-time teachers. It's a, it's a complicated issue here. Full-time teachers need financial support because they can't carry their own load because they're spending full-time teaching. They can't make any money elsewhere. They need, they need your support. That's, that's the idea there. Verse seven is often actually extracted from the context of verse six. God cannot be mocked. It's actually following up on that same idea. Oh, by the way, if you think you can get away without good teachers, you're fooling yourself. If you think you can get away without paying them, you're fooling yourself. Not going to work. Because whatever you reap, what you sow, skimp on paying your teachers, you're going to get bad teachers. You're going to get poor quality. It's this larger context. Now, does the... the the maxim, you reap what you sow and you sow what you, yeah, that, that's true also. It's probably, there's probably things in the Proverbs that actually illustrate that. But in the context here, he's actually talking about paying full-time teachers. And we know in 1 Timothy 5, excuse me, that there were some who were full-time engaged in the ministry of teaching as pastors. And Paul says they deserve a double pay. So we know that even in the early church, they were paying teachers, whatever that meant. And Paul, that's Paul, Paul's answer there. Now, obviously, Paul, as you might know, we'll get into the book of Acts as we go further. Paul said, I'm not taking any pay because there was another cultural thing. And that is in the Roman culture, greco Roman culture, if I give you something, you owe me. Remember this debt obligation that we've talked about so many times. So as soon as I pay you, I'm now under your, I'm not, you know, you, you now owe me. 
And by the way, that's why I, as a senior pastor, I don't know, uh, Karu Nakar and, and Marcus and Dara, I don't know what your ministry context is like. So don't take this as the way you should do it in India. It, it, it might be different. But I made absolute effort to never know when I was a senior pastor who gave. Because I never wanted anybody to come in my office thinking they had one up because I'm a big donor. And if you don't do what I do or what I say, I'm leaving your church. My answer is leave. Sorry. You know, I mean, if you're, if it's wrong, I didn't want to be compelled like, oh, they're a big donor. We you know the budget can't afford that. So if I don't know that, then I never act that way. And it never influences my thinking in that particular context. And I let the congregation know, I don't know who gives. Uh, and in our church, by the way, you know, the, the tithes and offerings would be counted because, you know, they, they collect them in a, in a dish and then they bring it forward and they put it on the altar and we sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. You know, it's, it's kind of a cool little act. That's, that's cool. Uh, and they put it on the altar. Uh, and uh, the money's up there. So the deacons, somebody has to count that money and then put it in an envelope and then put it there for, you know, the administration to take care of it. So they, but they need a sec, they need, a, they always have to have it verified. It has to be two people. Hey, Rob, can you, ver and I'm like, no, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to sign that as if I helped count or handle the money. I, I don't, I don't want to look at the checks. Obviously it was the cash that we had to make sure we uh, accurate count of. But I, I think that's an important principle there. Um, idea. So, okay. Um, verse nine, All right, There's more to be said here. Maybe you have some thoughts or questions here in a second, but don't become weary in doing good. And again, it's still in reference to financially supporting your full-time teachers, okay, within the church context there. Uh, so uh, using your resources to help this, this wider community. Now, uh, I, actually, I think the larger context is going to fall in the next passage, so I'll, I'll save that a, a little bit there for now. Um, let me read the quote from N.T. Wright and see if you guys have any comments here. Okay. Uh, this is a long quote, so pay attention if you can. I'm ADD, so I wouldn't be able to pay attention, but if you can pay attention, I hope, I hope you can. Uh, the need for teaching, and perhaps especially the careful teaching of Scripture, needs to be underlined. It is deeply counterintuitive in today's Western world. Many supposedly biblical or conservative churches suffer from a kind of anti-intellectualism, right? So these biblical churches are like, we don't need, but by the way, I've had churches that didn't want to hire me or they were concerned about hiring me because I had a PhD. Okay. And you guys actually know what church that is. Uh, uh, they hired me anyways. I'll say it that way. Right. But they were concerned. Well, it's this anti-intellectualism. And the idea was, well, you know, you guys are so intellectual that you don't really know how to, to pastor and lead, lead people in the church. But that becomes that divide there when the staff and the leadership team doesn't have theological education. Okay. Then he says, many supposedly liberal churches suffer from a, suffer from a kind of pseudo-intellectualism, a false intellectualism. They think they're intellectual, but they're, but they're not. So in neither case, the liberal churches or the conservative churches, anti-intellectual or fake, uh, false intellectualism. In neither case is the Bible expected to say anything new. Very interesting. It's often used to provide weight for the conservatives or decor decorations for the liberals to what's already believed. This doesn't happen by accident, nor is it done by people with academic and or speaking gifts glancing at scripture from time to time and jotting down a few happy thoughts. He says, I write, of course, after 40 years of paid employment as a teacher in the church and university settings. I've been in, uh, uh, in both. I have seen numerous or enormous problems that arise in both short and long terms when biblical teaching has become skimpy or inadequate. This may be countercultural, but for Christian formation, there cannot be a higher priority than the work of teaching. For that, proper financial provision has to be made. Developing a well-formed Christian mind is not a private hobby. For those who enjoy mental gymnastics on the strange apparatus called scripture and theology, it's the lifeblood of the whole church. Uh, I think that's really powerful. And I do think it speaks a lot to the, I'm speaking now to us in the West here, the evangelical church that is about getting people in and about attracting people. And we teach spot, you know, we just proof text because I want to preach on this topic. So I'll find a passage that I think supports that. And we're not teaching the word. And the way I would say it would be Mark 4 says the word is the seed. And it's the seed of God that's planted. And the spirit causes it to grow while you're sleeping. You get up in the morning and there it is. It's fully. 
It, that is the power of the word. It has this power to transform. Even if I don't fully understand what it means, but I meditate upon it day and night, that's a wise person who's uh, like a tree firmly planted by streams of water who yields its leaf in season and it does not wither. So I really think there's an important place for that. But let me add another caveat. I think our modern educational system is messed up for in the church now I'm talking about. And I, I know a lot of seminaries, I work with uh, Eco Seminary called the Flourish Institute of Theology, whatever it's called, I'm trying to rectify this. And a lot of seminaries are trying to work on this. It's too expensive. And most people can't afford it. So I put my thumb up and, and I get a thumbs up sign on my uh, emoji on, on the screen. I can think I'll stop doing that. Um, it's too expensive and it takes too long. So I had pastors when I was pastoring in Cornerstone and Livermore, and I would meet with these pastors. And I'm like, look, this happens with a lot of youth pastors. They're charismatic pastors. They're good leaders. And they get thrust into ministry, 20 years old, no education at all. A lot of the guys at Cornerstone, by the way, or churches that I've taught up before, have no formal education when they kind of got started. They just, they're youth interns and they get, excellent. That, that's great. Get them experience, but get them an education. Don't get them experience at the expense of their education. Some of them went on and got their education anyways, but then like a bachelor's degree. And I was like, you need theological education, for some kind of education. I can't afford it. And I would tell them, I said, listen, if you were to go to the church tomorrow and say, God's calling me and my wife or me and my family to be missionaries in Russia, they would take an offering to support you monthly to go to Russia, even though you have no training or education, right? We send missionaries around the world who don't have any formal training. They might get a six month program here or there, but we're good to pay you to go to Russia and teach, but we're not going to pay you to learn here so you can minister. So I say, go ask people, go to the congregation, go to go. The, the leadership team wouldn't do it, but you need to do it yourself because you need that formal education. And so the problem becomes it's too expensive and it takes too much time. And by the time these guys get, or gals get done with their, their theological education, they're 27, 28, 34, 35, and they have a debt. And if you know anything about church ministry, it doesn't pay well. So now they're strapped with, I can't pay off my debt. And so it becomes the cycle. I think we need to focus on leadership development and training our leaders and obviously that's what, why, you know, Dara and Marcus and Karunaka are, 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 I'm excited that they're on this call because that's, even though these guys aren't getting a formal training education, they're getting, I think, hopefully good stuff. So that's just my exhortation there. All right. Anybody have any thoughts or comments here? This is my way. This, this, um, go ahead, Anthony, go ahead. I just sent you a note in the chat if you wouldn't mind. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Here we go. Um, I was gonna, uh, uh, before I read it here, um, oh, okay. Yeah, I can. Um, you want me to put it in the chat? That'd be fine. Okay. There you go. I was going to say, uh, this is where all the pastors in the room are like really excited that I'm saying what I just said. Um, but they're also afraid to say it themselves. Right. Uh, uh, it's, it's true. Uh, oh, the message is too long. Please try sending shorter ones. Okay, here we go. Uh, it's from his, it's from his commentary on the book of Galatians pages 493 and 494. So there's part one. Left off the word urgent. Sorry about that. I'm just kind of cutting that. Hopefully it'll work in two bites. Oh, I, it just went just to Anthony. I'm sorry. All right, let me go to, does everybody want it or just Anthony want it? You, okay, Helen wants it too. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, main chat group. Let me, let me do the first quote again. Sorry if you're watching us on YouTube and we're wasting your time. No, we're not. It's a good quote. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's always one of those things I always say, I, it's like why I didn't want to teach on Galatians because I knew I was going to have to address this passage and this is uncomfortableness of like, hey guys, so, but uh, let's move on. Uh, okay, here we go. The churches uh, I grew up in, they actually would um, support good. people like Minnes, you know, like to go to this, they call them school of preachings in the church of Christ, but okay. um, they, you know, they would support them and raise money like as if they were doing missionary work. Yeah, I think on that, I don't know if they did this or not, Anna, but it's say, hey, we're going to help pay for you to go to school. And then you're going to promise to stay here for two to three years after you finish your education. So you're going to pay it off by making sure, because we're going to train you and we want your training to actually serve our church. 
instead of just paying for, you know, I, I think that's an important part. It's, it's kind of like a you know, teach for America thing, you know, Hey, you go teach for two years in a, some school in inner city and we'll pay off your student loans. I, that, that's a great way of doing it. So I think that's a, an important uh, um, uh, aspect. So, so, so Rob, I'm, yeah. hmm, I'm really surprised because in my experience in the UK, any pastor had to go to yes. the, the theology college and so, do, before they, and then they become a deacon and then they, they're training under a, a full blown pastor for a number of years and then they're all dead. Yes. So it's that's just, correct. I think somebody can be a pastor of a church and not have any formal. Most training. American pastors have little theological training. I'm going to yeah. say most. Now, mainline denominations, they almost all do. Presbyterians, mm -hmm. Anglicans, Baptists, uh, not necessarily Baptists, uh, but they, but most of them do. And, th and they get ordained in the ordination process. So I was on the ordination committee for, for our denomination. Uh, the ordination process is you have to have a master's of divinity degree. You have to have an MDiv. Um, they began realizing that because the degree is so expensive and it takes so long to get it, can we make other ways of them doing it? So, so even our denominations relax that requirement a little bit but you still have to get the training somehow, even if it's not formally in an institution. But any non-denominational church, most mega churches that are not part of a denomination, no, it's not required. And in fact, I was actually looked down upon because I had formal education and they, they were resistant to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I don't know, but I think that's most churches in America. I could be wrong on that. It's certainly a lot of them. Well, to your point, you drive to the South, the Bible Belt, You've literally got a church on every block, and some of these churches are long are down long driveways and a private home. That's all throughout Mississippi. I just okay. got back from there in December, and you see it, or January, you see it everywhere. So wow. I really question how much of an education they've gotten, apart just from what they've heard and what they've been led to believe is true. So yeah, well, and again, part of it is the valuing of education, right? I mean, and again, it's hard because you can't afford that, and it's a big expense in the church. I get it, but I've seen enough budgets in my day to know that there are ways to cut and to prioritize that. Um, the reality is what the benefit of what you get when you train leaders is now they're going to be much more effective in what they're doing, um, much more effective in what they're doing. And uh, again, I'm all for children's camps. I'm all for children's programs. That's great because one of those kids might even become the next Karuna Kar or Marcus or Dara. They, they might become one of those. That, that's great. Um, and so you're investing in leaders there. But when you invest in a leader, you know you're influencing other leaders. And by the way, and that goes to, and, and I know Karuna Kar has, uh, has heard me say this before, but Marcus, of course, and Dara as well. That means that you guys that are in leadership, you should be investing in leaders yourselves. It, it, it's like good that you're here getting the training from, you know, the equipping from myself and the other calls that we, that we do, but you should also be taking this and investing in leaders and not just using it for your church as a whole, but raising up leaders. So uh, I, I won't say that anymore. Okay, here we go. Let's go to chapter six, 11 through 18 um, and uh, finish it up. I'm going to read just because we're running low on time. I don't know how that happened, but first of all, see what large letters I use as I'm writing with my own hand. So now we know we have the end of the letter as Paul gives his thanksgivings. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that you will not, so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised don't even keep the law themselves, but yet they desire you to have circumcision so they can boast in your flesh. But may it never be, this is a, a God forbid statement. Some of your translations might say, God forbid, may, gonoito, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision means anything nor uncircumcision, but new creation. And those who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. Now, my translation says, and upon the Israel of God. I don't think it should be and. It should be even um, uh, upon the, the Israel of God. We'll discuss that if we have time. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit brothers. Amen. So again, it's his first letter, but he doesn't end it with, and Timothy sends greetings and so does so-and-so and so does so-and-so and so does so-and-so. It's, but he does have at least the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your, be with your spirit. And it does end it with an amen. Um, but nonetheless, this becomes the, the end of the letter. Okay. Anything that you guys see or any questions or thoughts you have on that? Welcome, by the way, Bill. 
I'd like to know what the brand marks are. Okay, very good. Uh, the brand marks are the scar, most likely the physical scars Paul's had that, from the beatings that he's endured. That's what I think. I think it's the physical scars. And it, it could be the emotional scars, the trauma he's experienced. Those are the brand marks of the gospel of the cross of Christ. It literally means he's he's literally taken up his cross, not, not literally a cross, but he's taking up his cross and following Jesus and he's suffered for it. I, I think that's exactly what it means. Okay. All right. So let me see if I can provide a little bit of context here because there's two major issues here uh, that we have to get into now. So Paul's giving himself as an example and speaking against kind of these false teachers that goes back to chapter one. They're trying to force you to get circumcised, but they don't even keep the law themselves. Remember earlier in the letter, Paul says, if you're going to practice circumcision, then you got to do the whole law, but you can't do the whole law. They don't even try to do the whole law. They know they can't do it. Remember, Pharisees didn't believe that they could practice the whole law anyways. So their, their hypocrisy. So what are you doing? So oh, I have a problem now. All right. We have two groups of people. One are these false teachers that have come up from Jerusalem. And they're the authorities in Jerusalem, and they wanted to make sure that you're conforming to the law for a number of reasons. One, because of their strong Jewish roots and their strong roots in Pharisaical Judaism. But I think also because they were concerned because they're having so many problems from the Jewish community around Jerusalem. Hey, you Christians are, are, are allowing Gentiles and eating with them. You know, the Jewish community around Jerusalem, the non-Christian Jewish community, was providing persecution and opposition for them. So they have this strong theological conviction that Gentiles can enter the faith. This is widely Jewish. Gentiles can enter the faith, but they have to get circumcised. Some Jews would say, well, proselytes are welcomed in our community, but they actually don't get eternal life unless they're circumcised. So you have these theological convictions going on. That's the Jewish Christian contingency from Jerusalem who also is dealing with societal pressure of persecution around them. Then you have those up in Galatia. Now, remember, up in Galatia, there's a, it's more of a Gentile Hellenistic world. They speak Greek. They have Greek food, Greek clothes. So it's a different culture. So they don't have the same strong theological convictions that the Jews in Jerusalem have. They, they have them, but they were more lax on Gentiles. After all, they're surrounded by Gentiles. So the Galatian Christians were, and, the, and the Jews, they just were a little bit more relaxed about them. So they wanted to, however, make sure that we're conforming to the law, because here's the problem now. The Jews had certain privileges that were allowed them by the Romans because they're just simply not going to worship the Roman gods. The Romans knew that. They were exempt from certain taxes. They paid taxes to the temple in Jerusalem instead. And they were exempt from certain religious festivities. And because of that, they were looked down upon. And now you have all these Gentiles coming in. And the Gentiles coming in are causing problems in the society. Because, uh, hey, you guys just became Jewish, but you didn't even get circumcised. Are you saying that you don't have to pay that tax any longer either? Are you saying that you don't have to go to the, to the religious festivities either? So there were societal pressures. Uh, uh. Uh, the terrier is <laughs> acting like a terrier again. Sorry. So um, Bucky will attack Ruby if Ruby has one of his toys, only after we grab Ruby to get the toy away. So it's actually a problem. So uh, anyway, okay. so the idea was that the society was putting pressure in Galatia on these Galatian Christians because they were relaxing the, the rules and letting all these Gentiles come in to this Jewish religion and get the privileges that come along with being Jewish. And so their response was, no, 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 we're going to make them be circumcised. You Gentiles are welcome in, but you got to be circumcised because the Jewish Christian community was having problems with the Gentile community. Does that make sense? Because of the, of the society saying, hey, you guys don't get to fall, uh, be exempt from all, all those rules. So Paul's point is, wait a minute, they're doing this so that they don't get per persecuted. So those, that's two different groups then. 
One is they're doing it because uh, they they think you have to follow the law. That's the gent that's the Jerusalem guys, but they don't keep the law themselves. And then the second group is those who are trying to avoid persecution, uh, avoid persecution, um, and they just want to make a good showing and avoid avoid persecution. Paul's answer is, you know what? Guess what? Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. That's got. I don't. Sorry, I'm going to insert my own theological convictions here. I don't see how we can get around this Zionist claim with this. Circumcision doesn't mean anything. You can try to say, well, it doesn't mean anything for the Jew for the Christians. I don't have a problem with Jews being circumcised. I'm not saying that you have to leave your ethnic background. Like, you know, if if Marcus were to come to America and and worship, you know, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to be American. You know, if if an Asian Christian comes into our church, they can still be Asian and practice their Asian holidays. Either. That's fine. But circumcision as a defining characteristic of who they are, as part of God's, it's Paul, I think Paul's really, really clear here. Uh, and then he says, in fact, what matters is new creation. Now, and we'll discuss this as we proceed throughout the New Testament. New, the essence of the new creation is we have the spirit. The spirit in the heart of the believer is the sign, the evidence of new creation, because the essence of the new creation, the essence of Eden in the past, the essence of the new Jerusalem in the future is we will dwell in the presence of God. Right? In fact, Revelation 22 says we will see his face. So the Holy Spirit being in us is a sign of the end times or, or of the eschaton or of the new creation. So circumcision and uncircumcision don't matter. What matters is the new creation. Now look what he says. That's verse 15. Verse 16. Those who walk by this rule, the rule of love, we're all in the same kingdom by faith in Jesus Christ, not by circumcision or uncircumcision. He says, peace and mercy be upon them. And then he says, What's well, a very disputed passage, and I can't use this to argue, my, because it's, it's just too disputed. Is it the is it and upon the Israel of God, as if it's another group? Peace and mercy be upon them and upon them. The first upon them is those who walk by this rule. The second and upon them is the Israel of God, making them two different groups. If he makes them two different groups, he's undermining the whole letter. Everything Paul said in this letter is there aren't two groups. There's one. And circumcision and uncircumcision don't matter. We're all sons of Abraham. Remember, the gospel was preached to Abraham. He's the father of all who believe. I mean, all this stuff in Galatians 3, Galatians 4, that it's in Christ who's the seed of Abraham. The idea that there's two peoples in verse 16 doesn't make any sense. Those who walk by this rule and the Israel of God. It makes the most sense to say, and the Greek word, the word for and here absolutely can be translated as even, as an intensive, even upon the Israel of God, meaning those who walk by this rule are the Israel of God. Now, if that's the case, then there's an emphatic declaration of Paul that all Christians are the Israel of God, and you can see how that's problematic in Christian theological circles. So wouldn't go there with Daryl Bach or any other Christian Zionist friends of mine because it, it, it wouldn't work. It, it, it would just, he wouldn't agree with me. Um, but I think that uh, that's my opinion in terms of how the, how the passage is to be read. So, um, okay. Any questions or thoughts here as we finish up the book of Galatians? Uh, we already answered the bear mark, the, the brand marks of, the, of uh, Christ. That was a good question, Helen. Thank you. Um, question. Yeah, please. So, in, so it seems to me that circumcision is a really good barrier to entry for the group, you know? Yeah. Right? It's a way to keep people out of the club because you got to really want it to be circumcised. Sure, so, sure. You know, I just feel that's why Paul might be saying, no way, you know, everybody's part of the club of God. Well, yeah, I, I think that that's probably part of it also. And then I, I would also add the fact that it makes one group better than the other group, because look, you've done this, but the law says, and they didn't go that far. Mm -hmm. And the answer is if we do that, we make superiority and inferiority in, in the, 
And we don't, that's not what we have. We have one people of God with ethnic distinctions. Mm-hmm. That's and, often a, yeah, go ahead. And, and prove, and prove yourself worthy. Right. Right. Go By loving next, your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. And go the, road, go the next step and be circumcised. Prove that you're oh, worthy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, <laughs> That's Which not- and remember what Paul says. If Paul, what Paul says is, if you say that, the cross becomes w- irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is no, you can't have Jesus on the cross and s- prove yourself worthy. That's right. You you can't have both. Yeah, very good. So, okay, it's it's, uh, it's interesting that you brought up N.T. Wright. I sent it to you, I believe, but I watched a video earlier, and he's having a discussion with some evangelical or an evangelical panel. And they asked him about the whole Israel thing. And he said, real simply, if all the promises find their fulfillment in Jesus, then why are we even having this discussion on Zionism? It's not going to be another event. It's not going to be 1948 or 47. It's not going to be everybody wow. being raptured. It's already been settled. It's all yeah. in Christ. So yeah. there's no question that that's what anti rights theology. I'm actually right. surprised because he hasn't said that enough. Maybe he's saying it more lately, maybe, because we actually have asked him to speak up at different groups at different times. And he said, and, and part of it was actually, sorry, Helen, but it was the Anglican church. Um, they've actually had a lot of pressure it's because the Anglican church actually has a presence in Jerusalem. So mm-hmm. part of Mount Zion and Anthony, the church, that the, the school that we went to there uh, at, in Jerusalem, that was actually an Anglican property. I remember that. And if they spoke up, then they could lose that property because of the Israeli government with too, too much pressure on them. So that was a problem. And I think that goes back to the, to the conversation about the, the teacher that we talked about before we started online. I'm not going to say the name until I turn the recording off. Um, but uh, I think that was part of the problem and pressure on him also. So, yeah. So it's good to see N.T. Wright speaking up on that. And, and uh, uh, I think this is now a time that you, we have to speak up. I think that's kind of the, the whole point of this. So, yep. All right. Anybody else? All right. So if I were to stop or finish with like some parting words, I would simply say, obviously, you know, the grace of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, the, the cross of Christ and what it does and the significance of that would be an important summary of the book of Galatians, that we become members of the family of God, not because of works or righteousness or who we are, our status, our good looks, our education, but by faith in Jesus Christ, by the cross himself. Now we're called to follow in that by living in accordance with the spirit laying down our lives and fulfilling the law of Christ. I think all that's important. Um, I would also add, and I just lost my train of thought in terms of what I was going to go also at the beginning of this. Gosh, that's just happening way more. So yeah, exactly. Everybody knows exactly what I'm thinking right now. As I get older, it just happens so much more. Um, The other point I was going to say was, oh, notice how many problems Paul had. And notice how significant his problems were. This is to you guys that are pastors, Marcus and and, uh, and uh, Karanakar and Dara and, and others. We shouldn't be surprised that things like this are happening in our churches today because we don't even have an apostle to put an end to it. And guess what? Paul couldn't put an end to it. Just read 2 Corinthians. It's still going on. Um, and 1 Corinthians is a second letter he wrote to them, right? Uh, you know, so you see the conflict, you know, going back to, Galatia, to Acts 6 about who gets the food? Yeah, this is humanity entering into the church, and I, I think we need to. I don't have a solution. I think we need to recognize that, recognize that we are not called to be part of the problem, but a solution to the problem. It's easy for us to complain, and all that does is actually just make it worse. Find a way to be a solution and and be that solution. You know how I feel in terms of I'm disillusioned with. The modern church today, I think it's lost its way in a lot of ways. I'm talking about the Western American church now. It's lost its way, and it's um, uh, we've compromised the gospel too much. Um, there's good happening, but I think there's also, I don't know. So I, I got a book coming out sometime soon. We'll see how that when that, when that happens. All right, any thoughts? Any other observations? It's only going to get worse, by the way, for Paul. Uh, uh, he's going to have an argument with Barnabas in chapter 15 of the book of, of Acts. So. Yep, Barnabas and Paul have a, have a have a dispute and they and they split. So, um, uh, okay, very good. I'm gonna say goodbye to our Facebook friends again. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube or whatever, we are not gonna be in the. This is the last study in the Book of Galatians. Next week we'll go back to the Book of Acts, uh, the playlist in the Book of Acts. So thank you for joining us.